Good morning or afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Joe Johnson, and I'm the marketing coordinator for the electric and gas utility team here in Redlands, California. Our webinar today is a joint webinar with Clarion and Esri titled, Crank Up Your Contractor Engagement, Essential GIS Tools and Tips. At this time, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, Chris Kelly and Bill Meehan. Chris Kelly is a co-founder and senior vice president of Clarion. With over 20 years of experience in GIS technology, Chris works with utility, telecom, and other companies across the globe to provide innovative, easy to deploy solutions that solve complex operational challenges. Bill Meehan is the director of utility solutions for Esri. He is responsible for business development and marketing Esri geospatial technology to global electric and gas utilities. In addition to writing about GIS, Bill enjoys writing music and fiction books. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Bill Meehan. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. I used to work for, I used to work for a power company several years ago, and um, we and one of the one of the things I'm really excited about in this webinar is this idea of contractors. During uh, my work in, in the utility company, I ran electric operations, and so contractors were really a part of what we did every single day. And and one of the problems that we always had with contractors was th this ability to tell them stuff, to to organize them, to give them critical information. And we had a lot of critical information in our systems, in our SCADA systems, in our in our GIS and our outage management systems. Of course, those contractors really didn't have access to that. So what did we do? We used paper and forms and all kinds of stuff. And of course, that became uh, really difficult and awkward. And one particular situation I recall, we had brought in foreign crews. And by foreign crews, for those that don't know, these are crews from other utilities that we bring in during major emergencies. And in the case uh, where I was working up in the Northeast, it was usually a big snowstorm. And so we would bring them in, and, and it was really difficult. We needed the help, but just to organize them and getting, getting them information about the system. Of course, they were coming in, sometimes they were coming in from Ohio and from Canada, you never knew. So just getting the right information was really, really difficult. And so one of the things that I like to talk about today is the movement of GIS, which has been, even, even when it became digital, it was still heavily oriented around paper. And what I like to do is to think about GIS as really evolving maybe even transforming itself from kind of an application, you know, a mapping application to a true platform. And sometimes when people ask me, well, a platform, what, what, is, what does that really mean? And to describe a platform like the ArcGIS platform, I like to use the, the kind of anal analogy of the music industry. So for many, many years, as you can see in the slide, uh, people used devices for listening to music. And over the years, it evolved from records to CDs to, I mean, to, to cassettes to CDs and so forth. And this device was kind of the field device. It was a, it was called the disc man, right? Everybody remembers that, and some people maybe even still use it. And what I like to do is to say to people, well, what actually changed? What what replaced the disc man? And it was the iPod. And one of the reasons. What the iPod was so good and such a good replacement for the disc man, it was because it was much smaller and you could put a lot of songs on it, you could put the thing in your pocket, you didn't have to hang it from your belt. But probably the most interesting reason why the, the iPod was so much better than the disc man was shown in this next slide. You didn't have to have thousands of these CDs. I've got CDs in my garage and in my glove compartment, all that sort of stuff. So you'd say, well, that was really good. That was what made the disc man uh, obsolete was the, the iPod because of not using CDs. But what was actually going on here? It wasn't really the CDs. It wasn't really the iPod. What it was is the iTunes platform. Not only did it just kind of change the way we thought about music, it literally transformed Everything we know about the music industry, how we buy music, how we listen to music, and that, even that, and that transformation is still ongoing with things like Amazon's product. We just say, hey, uh, play me a song, and it figures out what song it is. You don't have to buy anything. So, so this transformation is a result of a platform, and platforms are now becoming very, very common in our life. And the other platform that people who literally almost everybody uses is this next one called Facebook. Everybody uses Facebook, right? And it's <clears throat> Facebook isn't a place to put pictures or a place to, you know, kind of tell stories. It's really about collaboration, about communicating broadly across a whole range of people. 
And that's when I think back to what I was dealing with with contractors, boy, wouldn't it be great to have something like a Facebook that I could communicate to contractors? The problem with Facebook is it didn't have all the critical data that I needed. So this platform is really, really, this idea of a platform is about communication. And, and there's a, a book that I really like, and I would encourage everybody to read it. Uh, it's by Phil Simon. It's called The Age of the Platform. And if you're really wondering what a platform is all about, read this book. But there's one line out of that book which I really like, and a platform allows people to reach and connect with one another and obtain information. And sure, the contract is working for a utility company. Now, the people that I would really like to reach and connect one another and obtain information and give information to. So that's really the idea. Today, <coughs> we use maps, we use GIS, and, but, but we, still, we still rely on paper. And what we love to do as utility people is we love to print out those maps and stick them up on the wall. The problem is the poor contractor out in the truck in the field in the middle of the snowstorm you know, has a hard time figuring out what's going on with these maps that we love to hang on the wall. And then, you know, I can remember, you know, sitting there with a with my desk was full of forms and paper, and you know, that's still true today for many, many people. So the idea is to to change the kind of the game, just like the iTunes completely transformed the way we deal with music. The ArcGIS platform, which is shown kind of diagrammatically in this, in this diagram, is about really three things, the three things that begin with C. Communication, collaboration, and coordination. And if there's any kind of any uh, group of people that need that sort of thing, it's between utilities and their contractors. And if you look at this slide on the left, or this diagram on the left, <coughs> there's really three components to it. On the bottom, below the line, is, is the data, and that's really the GIS data and, and, and really associated information that contractors and utilities need, and that's typically kept in the GIS or sometimes in, in other associated systems that are linked to the GIS, GIS. And on the right of that below the line is this funny little symbol which really indicates data that's coming from anywhere. So for example, uh, wind information or traffic information or flooding information, and now the ability to pull those pieces together becomes really critical. In the middle is this sort of infrastructure of the platform, that's the ArcGIS platform, it uses the cloud or on-premise, the ability to pull all this data together and do exactly those three C's, communicate, collaborate, and coordinate information. And on the top of that, uh, that diagram above the line are the, the devices. And so one of the things we, th we say about the ArcGIS platform is that we can communicate GIS critical information and functionality anytime, any place, on any device. And that's really what a platform is. So what's really exciting about this um, webinar is Chris Kelly's kind of notion of how we can take this concept of an ArcGIS platform and apply it to really be able to communicate, collaborate, and coordinate with a critical component of your workforce, which is contractors. And I, and I believe as, as time will go on, utilities will be more and more relying on contractors. So this is going to be really, really interesting. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Kelly. And Chris, give us a little view on how we can work with contractors in a much more effective way using the ArcGIS platform and the Clarion products. Okay, great. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, everybody uh, out there for joining us today. Um, for the next uh, half hour or so, I want to walk through these topics, these questions. Um, and our goal is to leave some time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So uh, please be thinking about questions that you might want us to elaborate on and, uh, and submit your questions to the moderator through the, uh, through the webinar app there. Okay, so let's step back and, and let's, let's ask the question, what do we mean by contractor engagement, uh, the title of the webinar? So, you know, it's Valentine's Day and, and you probably some of you have been working with uh, your contractors for so long you feel like you're married, but that's not really what we mean. Uh, we're actually, when we talk about increasing the level of engagement with contractors uh, working on your system, we mean connecting everybody together uh, in a near real-time uh, way through a single integrated system or, or a platform. So another way to say contractor engagement is, in our minds, talking about creating a contractor GIS. Now, when we've been thinking about GIS uh, really for the last several years, this, this notion of GIS being really three different systems uh, I think is really important. So 
Um, if you look at, on the left, the three systems, we have the system of record, the system of engagement, and the system of insight. And what a contractor GIS does is it takes the core capabilities of the Esri platform, and we layer on specialized tools that are designed to do specific things uh, around managing, say, multiple contractor entities across the entire life cycle of the work that you do. So the three systems are comprised of both out-of-the-box Esri apps that you may be familiar with and then specialized tools that address uh, work that is performed in various roles within your organization, both you and your contractors. So the system of record is about data like quarterly or annual work plans and uh, field designs, maintenance plans, all the way down to things like uh, property level permission and permitting information. Uh, the system of engagement is, is, is a much simpler set of tools that takes that data that you create in the system of record and present it in very easy to deploy apps, uh, both tablet and phone and web apps, so that people can see what's going on. So it could be your crew foreman, the back office uh, personnel for your contractors, uh, managers, and executives. And then finally, the system of insight includes uh, Esri dashboards, which you may have seen out of the box, and also some advanced analytics and reporting. So you really can cover uh, reporting and analysis from the simple to the complex. And you know, our experience over the past 10 years um, as an Esri partner is really building solutions that engage contractors with uh, probably most of you in the audience today, the asset owners. Um, and we're doing this across a lot of different industries for a lot of different types of activities like vegetation management, damage assessment, and asset inspection. And then across a lot of different roles within both the utility regulators and the contractor organizations themselves. And what it ends up looking like is this. It's a collection of, of, of of software tools that are designed to provide the information and the capabilities of different users in different, role, in different roles, but all working across a single system. So you've got a single back-end database and a single portal for connecting everyone together, but you've got purpose-built applications that allow people to do various things. So for example, you've got desktop tools for creating projects and jobs and and, and, and assigning work, and you've got a, a rich, uh, robust mobile work planning tool for the people, the professionals that are doing data creation, data input, uh, 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 you know, multiple hours during the day. And then you've got another mobile tool that's really just a simple crew work completion tool that allows people executing the work in the field to update things like statuses and, and noting exceptions to the work they're doing. And then finally, you've got browser maps, tablet apps, native tablet apps. Um, they're showing work status in real time and rolling all that up into dashboards that summarize your work progress. So that's what it looks like. And I want to drill down into this a, a lot more, but first I want to tell uh, a story, actually two stories. Um, I think it'll give a little bit more context for, 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 for why we're thinking about this and, and why people are investing in this type of, of technology. Uh, and I want to tell you two uh, real-life stories from uh, our customers about um, specific challenges that, that they faced uh, and, and how that plays into a contractor-facing system. So these are stories that um, have very different outcomes, and I'm going to tell you the, the end of the story uh, at the end of my talk. So the first story is about um, a storm response, a restoration effort uh, at an electric utility. Um, this was one of our customers who used our software for their daily maintenance activities. They had a storm. They switched to storm mode, and their their permanent or their employees and their long-term contractors who've been onboarded and used the the software, you know, in the field on a daily basis, they they instantly had tools that allowed them to collect information in the field about storm damage, put it on a map, and share that across the organization. But the workload for that particular Storm response required additional resources. They brought in, as Bill mentioned, this happens um, when he was in the utility, bringing in contractors from outside in a very short notice. So the outside contractor crew leaders, they had, they had smartphones, but that didn't quite get them there. 
The second story is about uh, unhappy customers. So we have a customer, and one of the things that they wanted to do was to really start measuring the response and resolution times when customers called in and asked them to come out and do um, do things on their property. This is primarily around uh, coming and looking at, at, at vegetation around the electrical system. They had, they had instinct that they weren't doing a great job, uh, that their resolution times were long and, and the customer service was not where they wanted it to be. They started collecting information through uh, a contractor-facing system, and what they found was their average response time for customer-initiated tickets was 45 days. So they had paper-based processes that were creating issues of lost tickets and no information flowing back to the utility. So I'm going to tell you the outcome of both of those stories, but I wanted to set up that um, to create some context for what we're talking about today. And really the point there is to try to get you to think about the question of why should we care? Why should I, if I'm a utility manager, care about uh, contractors being in the system. So I think those two stories illustrate some of the some of the benefits or some of the challenges, maybe. Um, but really, it, it goes further than that. So if you think about why you outsource, so you outsource maintenance and other field activities to uh, get the work done, but the responsibility is still on you as the asset owner or the operator to make sure that it's getting done on time and it's getting done correctly. So a lot of what you as a utility or an asset owner need to report up to management or out to regulators on is what's planned and what's done. So when you look at a contractor community within your organization, you have maybe you have long-term contractors who are doing planning and auditing. Uh, maybe you have a much more dynamic set of contractors who are actually doing the work, different contractors doing different types of work. The key there is what's done is critical. So contractor-facing system can allow you to see what's planned and what's actual percent complete versus uh, percent to budget um, so that you can have a, a real-time view of what's going on. The second key benefit is visibility. So one of the things that I think is becoming more and more important and will continue to be an important core competency uh, as a utility or other type of asset owner is the ability to, to bring contractors, get them engaged, onboarded uh, in, a, in a quick manner, and that's going to increase your flexibility. So if you're in, in good communication with your contractors, you're sharing information uh, back and forth, you have visibility into what they have visibility into what you expect of them, and you have visibility in what they're doing, then you're going to be in a position to increase your flexibility as someone who hires contractors. And I think that a lot of times when you had uh, contractors without any sort of system other than paper, uh, maybe your contractors were collecting a lot of data, but that information wasn't necessarily being shared back to you. So it puts you in a position to potentially become beholden to certain contractors because you didn't have the data that you know you needed in order to manage your, your programs on a go-forward basis. So when you have uh, a system of, of exchange and you're, and you're owning the system of record and you have that data, then instead of being, being held captive uh, potentially to your contractors, you'll have the knowledge and the understanding, the long uh, multi-cycle view of what's going on on the ground, and you can use that information to make wise choices and also to uh, get some flexibility and even some, some leverage uh, in, in your contractor relationships. And I think the key here, and probably most of you understand, is the stakes are really high. Um, obviously, things like what's planned and what's done um, are important to regulators. You know, in certain cases, it's uh, you've got federal regulations like uh, NERC FAC 003 and a lot of state reg uh, state level regulations that they want to know what's done uh, uh, by your contractors, and you need to know who did it and what was done. But, but just as importantly and becoming more importantly is the question of when and where. So obviously having a map-based system allows you to do that, but that's not even the whole story. So if you take that whole concept of, of having a good record, an accurate record of what, what's happening, think about, think about your customer 
and, and interactions with the public and think about environmental sensitivity among the public and how that impacts um, the regulators and how it impacts your, your executives. So if you think about the way that, that, uh, that the public and, and, and your customers specifically, how they interact with you, for the most part, maybe you're reading meters electronically and, and you're sending out e-bills and, and taking payment over the internet. Your contractors are physically there. They're out on the streets. They're even physically on your customer's property. And you want to know what's happening. There's interactions there that you need to, to respond to. But you also want your contractors to know any agreements you have and what can and can't be done. And likewise with environmental data. So if you do things like apply herbicides or you know, cut brush or vegetation, if you, if you plow up the ground to put in underground facilities, all of that is potential environmental liability. But it's also an opportunity that if you do these things professionally and conscientiously and you record those things, you can tout your commitment to sustainability. So there's a lot of stakes here, but there's also a lot of opportunities to uh, to, to document and, and, and actually make good uh, public information about the good things you're doing. And you know the, the key point here is that this is truly driving better outcomes in terms of lowering costs, providing greater safety, improved reliability, and a better uh, sense of customer service. And, and that's really the goal. And I think what, what we get here is this idea that Having contractors engaged in a single system of, of information and having it map-based and geospatial, it really creates a, an opportunity to drive a new level of efficiency. And it's not just about simply driving your costs lower. You can actually use this as a platform to make your contractors better as well. So if your contractors can get instant feedback on any work uh, that you audited and they know exactly what the list is, and where the work is that they need to go back and relook at, then that's going to help them react to uh, your QAQC program. It could also help them get paid faster. So this is a way not just to, uh, you know, to drive your costs down uh, uh, in a unilateral way, but also to help your contractors drive their costs and cost down and improve their outcomes. So just to summarize that, um, a system of contractor engagement or contractor GIS is all about getting on the same page. So it's a single, it's a single integrated software system. It's real time or near real time. Um, it's definitely two way and it's definitely geospatial. And I think one of the key things is it has to be optimized for the for the work that you do. So this needs to be really tailorable to your specific workflows and your specific processes that you follow. And I think that you can get um, a lot of uh, a lot of effect uh, of efficiencies out of that, but also uh, greater transparency and accountability and speed in what you do. Okay, so why are we talking about this now? Um, I think that the important point here about the timing, and I mentioned that Clearing's been doing this for ten years, is that this technology is mature, and uh, the good news is there's a lot of real experience. Uh, for you to draw from if you're thinking about doing this. Um, when we started deploying uh, software out to contractors, uh, in, you know, 2007, 2008, um, you know, a lot of the technology really, uh, I think we can look back and safely say now, wasn't mature. I think that today, you know, we're not complaining about, uh, you know, a 20-pound tough book that takes 20 minutes to boot up. I think that a lot of the technology obstacles have been cleared, and you have things like you know, cross-platform apps that are integrated out of the box with, uh, with these system of record tools. And the hardware is caught up with the vision. So you guys probably know this, but you know, a lot of the hard work has been done, and, and you know, that's thanks in part to uh, advances in hardware and, uh, and, and really good field technology, but also investments that Esri's made in things like real-time dashboards and and web apps and tablet apps uh, that work right out of the gate. Um, another thing that has really changed, uh, and, and by the way, this uh, this is Bronson, and uh, he is wearing 
uh, PPE, and he does actually work on a real crew that runs clearing technology uh, out on a right away. So, you know, the idea here is that, um, you know, with old dogs and, and new tricks, uh, the common wisdom when we started was that you could use you could use software, you could give a tablet to, you know, a professional uh, uh, engineer or a, an arborist or an auditor. Um, but there's no way that you're going to get a crew foreman to use uh, technology. And that has absolutely changed. Um, really one of the most fundamental changes that we've seen uh, in, in, in the mindset of the, of the industry. And um, I think that you can not only expect to see um, this uh, idea of uh, you could uh, do this, but really that you can and, and you should be doing this. Another, another thing that I think that's important to, to think about and to really look out for is, is don't think about data collection as just being a manual process. I mean, there will always be forms and pick lists and, and you know, people at various stages of the work process entering data. Um, but data automation through sensors is happening. And I think about it as the Fitbit analogy that um, I, I love seeing how well I, I did in terms of my steps and my sleep, uh, but obviously I wouldn't count my steps on a daily basis. So think about think about opportunities to automate data uh, through sensors. Uh, one of the ways this is happening, just to, to dive into a specific example, is um, we have a customer that has invested in this uh, uh, roadside and and, tra and rail spraying technology. So those those sp those uh, sprayers you see uh, are hooked up to sensors that track things like flow rate and what you know what product is being put down those are connected up to GPS and there's there's a there's a sensor recording all that data so a lot like when my Fitbit syncs to my phone we can sync that into GIS and we marry that up with work management data about the job and the operators and we have really rich information about uh, not just who and what but where and when uh, in this case the herbicides getting put down so I think that's a great example of the things to, to look out for. So quickly here, four questions we thought of that would be uh, you know, worth, worth asking as you think about getting into this. Um, the first one is about a very serious uh, uh, question about uh, sensitive uh, data and, and, and secure data. And I think the, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that you have to be thinking about data security from the very beginning because if you don't, I guarantee you someone from your IT department will think of it for you. And it's going to be better to be uh, in, out in front on, on that question. Uh, keep in mind that first, not all data is equally sensitive. Um, and, and the second point is that you don't need to give everyone in your organization every piece of information. So think about data and think about sensitive data from the perspective of, of, of the role. So you might have people that need access to your network map, if you're an electric utility, uh, or to a customer database. Uh, they Maybe those are work planners uh, that need access to uh, customer and utility sensitive data. But think about different roles where you've got a, you know, a contractor crew foreman who maybe doesn't need to know the location of every pole in your system or every customer on your system. They just need to know where the work is that they need to do. So think about separating out your information that you have uh, by role. The second thing to think about is, is speed, flexibility, and scalability. So in the example of the storm from before, uh, we really needed to ramp up a large number of temporary crews quickly. So uh, having a plan for how you're going to do that in any sort of emergency response, how you're going to do rapid onboarding, how you're going to do deployment, credentials, all of those things need to be really baked into your plan and, and a part of the platform that you choose for bringing your contractors on board. The third question is, is about this, uh, uh, this debate on you know, cloud versus on-premise. So should you, should you put your contractor-facing systems on a server in the cloud, or should you keep them on your internal infrastructure? Uh, we have customers that uh, literally have a version of our software for one group 
uh, in the cloud and another version of, uh, of our software on on-premise servers. So, you know, certainly going to be an ongoing debate, but there's some things to consider here um, that link back to this whole idea of, of, of how, you, how you might separate out your data. Um, so, without going into this too deeply, um, I think it's, it's, it's good to think about the, uh, the idea that maybe there's certain types of, of systems, especially contractor-based systems, that increase your overall security if they're outside your network. So if you have a need to have a lot of different contractors, potentially even contractors that you want to support bring your own device, that need to be able to get to information, instead of having them come through your firewall, uh, maybe you have the non-sensitive information outside on a cloud-based system. Now you're going to, you know, you're going to increase your uh, your IT scrutiny, and you may need to increase the amount of uh, of vendor managed services to support those contractor users. But remember, just because your server is in the cloud, it doesn't mean that all your data has to go in the cloud. And that gets back to the strategy of separating out data by role. The last question that we wanted to pose to you today is thinking about um, what's the important information that you and your contractors together will collect and manage to support goals of, of why you're doing contractor GIS. Now this is not a comprehensive list, but some things that we've seen uh, really drive uh, outcomes and, and drive results is look at things like time, so not just response time, completion time, but how you're doing versus your budgets and versus your, your, your time estimates. And even look at, you know, all the way down to the timesheet data for crews and equipment. Look at quality. Look at work quality, timeliness, accuracy. Uh, it'll give you the ability to look at things like, you know, what percentage of, um, of, of work that's being reported in the system gets flagged as some sort of audit defect or go back. Um, and then, uh, think about information at the contractor level, the crew level, and the task level so you can benchmark uh, your, your contractors and performance, not just against each other, but maybe even with uh, looking at geographical differences. And of course, make sure that you're collecting location about everything you do. Hey, Chris, this is uh, Bill. I just wanted to jump in. Yeah. Uh, you you brought up something there when you said types of data, and then you said quality. And it, uh, you know, having worked in, in the utility business for a long time, uh, the data quality in in some of the systems of record that you described isn't always that good. And and it reminded me of a bit of a story about uh, when I was working for the power company. What I used to like to do, I was the boss of operations, but I used to like to drive around with the troubleshooters because the troubleshooters seemed to have a really good knowledge what was going on uh, in the system. And, and I remember this one particular troubleshooter named Paul I used to drive around with, and, and he was pulling up to a switch. And he, he had to, um, he looked at the switch and he was a little troubled by it. Uh, so he, um, he sort of hesitated. Uh, he, he, didn't want, he didn't want me to know what he was going to do next. And I'm like, well, what's the matter, Paul? He said, well, uh, he, was, he was feeling very uncomfortable. So eventually, I said, "Well, look, Paul, you know, just do what you need to do." So he he went he went in his truck. He pulled his truck over, and he pulled out from under the seat a whole stack of of drawings. These were these were uh, maps maps of the electric system, and they were beautifully and neatly annotated in red. And I said, "Paul, what's this?" He said, "Well, you know, I." I like to keep a good record of what's going on because I can't trust the data that's in the GIS. Well, I was sort of the king of GIS, and I, I had helped put the GIS system in place. So he didn't want he didn't want to hurt my feelings. Plus, he probably didn't want to get in trouble. I said, "That's okay." I said, "Well, why don't you give all this great data over to the uh, to the mapping department? They could put it in." No, no, I know it's the only record that he had. So this was a an employee, not a contractor. But I I, I think back of it is how I mean, the data that he was. He had on that on those drawings was probably really really good, but no one else had access to it. I mean, not even his his uh, uh, colleagues that were troubleshooters. So I thought, as you were speaking, if the uh, if an employee isn't really willing to share data easily, and they're using maps and maybe even using computers, but to take and they, they didn't and we didn't give them an opportunity to collaborate that data. For one thing, you know, if he did give that data over to the mapping department, maybe it would take 
weeks or months to get that data pulled up on the maps. But if an employee is unwilling to do that, I mean, you can imagine the contractors are unwilling or maybe they just don't have the mechanism to be able to share that information other than on a piece of paper. And, and the other thing is, if, if we couldn't hold people accountable for the job that they were, they were doing if, uh, if there was no documentation. I mean, if you're in the middle of a storm or, or, or even a busy time, if contractors aren't given the ability to communicate, collaborate, and coordinate their information by immediate access to what they see, then there's no way to go back and say, well, the contractor didn't do a good job because there's really no record of what they did or didn't do, and then it's going to be finger pointing. So the, the idea idea of making information available both from the company to the contractor, from the contractor to the company, is essential for improving overall data quality. So you'd say, well, what's the underlying symptom of having not good data quality in the GIS? It's the lack of the ability to people to communicate what has gone on uh, when it's going on, not six weeks later or two months later. And if they write it on a piece of paper and two months later somebody's trying to figure out what they wrote, it might be difficult. They may have moved on to another job or they just don't remember. I can't remember stuff that I did yesterday, let alone two months ago. So it's so important to be able to get that rapid, that immediate um, feedback from what they see in the field, what they did, what they accomplished, to, to make what, as you said, Chris, to make contractors better. Now, contractors want to do a good job, as well as my experience is that most employees want to do a good job. But if there's that lack of ability to tell people what's going on, then the job just won't get done well. And the end result, I think, and I've, my experience has been, things just take longer to do, they cost more, they a lower customer satisfaction, and in some cases, they can actually result in uh, uh, compliance uh, failures, fines, and so all of those things are really, really important to the to the utility company. So that's just kind of my sense of, uh, of of how important it is to get rapid feedback to what somebody's doing in the field, and that just just makes the overall um, operations that much more uh, efficient and smooth. Uh, back to you, Chris. It's a great point, Bill. Thanks for for that, and you know I think that it. That's a great segue into this this question of how do you get started, and you know I think that the, the key point that that comes to my mind when I think about you know how do you start really just have to start, and once you start, once you put this technology into the hands of, of the people in the field that allows them to to make these notes to to document the things that they they need to do a good job. Uh, because I agree that, that by and large people want to be very good at, at what they do, whether they're utility employees or contractors. Um, once you put this into their hands, it's, it's just phenomenal to see how the, uh, the innovation, even down at the, at, the, at the front lines of these crews, uh, starts, to, uh, starts to, to, to take root. So I think that you know, once you look at you know how you get started. You do right. Do you have the right foundation? I mean, obviously, you need to have some uh, GIS data, but it's you know it's, you don't have to have every pole mapped uh, down to you know to, to ten centimeters. I mean, you can you can work with uh, imperfect data, and we have customers that are being very successful working um, with less than perfect data, and they're in, in, as they rely on this information in the field more. They're finding more drivers to improve the the, the base uh, GIS data. Um, so you know, evaluate what data you have. Make sure you have a platform that ties everything together, and then develop a plan to put a contractor engagement layer uh, onto um, onto your to your GIS platform. And when I talk about the hardest part is just getting started. If you can find um, a few core processes that you want to automate. That'll allow you to set attainable goals um, that that give you that that jumping off point. So target a few of your highest value processes. I'm not even saying pick vegetation management. I'm saying if you're going to do something in vegetation management, of the probably the 25 things that means for your organization, pick a few and and really automate those. Get good, and once the core processes are in place, take a look at how you can, with your contractors, implement rapid improvements. 
you know, so um, we, we developed a checklist here, and I won't read through all of this, but as you think about your needs around, uh, you know, how you would start and what, and what you want to try to accomplish in, in really a first phase is uh, there are a few, a few keys. One is that in, you need to think about this as an end-to-end -end solution. So you need to have tools that touch every stage of the process. Um, and as we've talked about before, it's got to be geospatial. Um, and um, when you think about this idea that you want to continually adapt your software to your processes, and then once you see with 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 software and with this with this contractor GIS, you can actually improve your processes. It's going to be a constantly changing and improving situation. So you want to make sure that your tools are configurable and adaptable, and and and, and of course simple. So if you think about uh, this, if you're if you're considering planning this out, I think it's important to to um, consider. Uh, not just how you start, but also how how you how you deploy and 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 really drive this through as a as almost a cultural type of thing that you you and your contractors are are adopting. So there's four keys that we've seen uh, for adoption. The first one is make it easy, and, and by that I mean just simplify, especially in the beginning. Don't over don't don't try to collect too much data. You know, crawl before you walk and walk before you run, and then. Have a mindset going to, into this where you have an iterative, you know, people call it an agile development approach. So you're going to get some early wins, keep it simple, then start to optimize or maximize over time. So let 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 you and your contractors see some of the benefits, and then um, and then build on that. Uh, number three, always be in the mode of educating uh, across the board. Be proactive in your support. Make sure that the frontline people in the field are comfortable with what's happening and, and listen to them. Be sure you've got things like help desk, field visits, training, and encourage your contractors to build their own uh, adoption support infrastructure. That could just mean finding a, a couple of super users that can uh, be your first line of support if somebody has a basic question. And then finally, do everything you can to cut red tape. Um, in, in making the uh, the onboarding process faster, um, you know the adoption, the deployment, you know think about ways that make that initial exposure that can be the scariest uh, as easy as possible, and that's going to speed you through the adoption curve. So just a couple more quick points here, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so what else? What else do we think about when we we talk to our customers about being successful with this type of thing? Um, the first thing is that this technology is matured enough and it's proven enough where you can shift your expectations for your contractors from, you know, this is important to us and we'd like for you to do this to this is how we are doing business on a go-forward basis. This is the new mode of operation. And we don't want paper timesheets from you. We don't want... Uh, uh, a, an Excel spreadsheet with uh, with your work progress. We want to be working off the same uh, single source of truth in in our contractor facing system, and that's a fair that's a fair expectation in today's environment. Um, the second thing is a much more collaborative uh, uh, concept than just saying this is how you're going to do it, but you say we're going to make this worth it to you. So we want you to to be incentivized here. Uh, we want uh, we're, we want you to get some benefits out of this as well. Now we're going to make this um, you know we're, we're going to use this to measure you, and, and we're going to use it to measure uh, the other contractors on the system. But this allows you to create incentive structures and even to start to change the way that you that you scope uh, your your contractor work and, and pay for it. So um, this is not just about, um, about your benefits as the asset owner or the utility or the telecommunications company, but also about uh, allowing your contractors to do better work and ultimately become more competitive. Okay, so I want to wrap up here, um, but I want to finish uh, my two stories. So uh, I mentioned when we started that 
these two stories had um, had different outcomes. So the storm story, um, we had a setup where the the normal work group was connected through a system that included contractors. But when you had a when you had a large event, you had these uh, these these outside crews coming in. They had smartphones, but what really happened in this case, because those smartphones weren't allowed to connect into into the contractor GIS, they didn't have that mechanism in place, is that the people using the, the contractor GIS in the field taking screenshots and emailing them. So you'd get a, uh, an email with the screenshot and you'd see a map, but there's no way to navigate to that to that point on the map, it was just a picture. So even though they had some information, they didn't have all the information, and they weren't connected into the system, so they weren't really able to maximize uh, all of the all of the uh, the capabilities that they would have. So the the takeaway there is that if you don't plan for it ahead of time, you're not going to be able to turn on a dime and get. Uh, outside contractors or, or, or a, a large-scale ramp-up plugged in. So you've got to plan ahead. Um, the second story is a little bit more of a, of, a, of a success story than a lesson. So if you remember, we had a contractor, uh, uh, we had an organization with multiple contractors. They were all getting uh, customer requests, and they found that they were, uh, on average, taking about 45 days to get those resolved. So they got, uh, they invested in a process, they invested in an in integration where uh, a, a call was logged to an address at, in the call center, and through integration it showed up all the way down to the, to the contractor's uh, work queue. And they could see all of the tickets that were in and what the request was, and they could go out, and, and when they did their investigation and maybe issued some, some actual work, they would, they would note that, and the status would change, and the timestamps would occur automatically. And all that information was put up onto a dashboard. And so they started looking at those dashboards together and looking at the response time. And over the course of a year, with having the technology and proactive management, they brought the average response time to customer requests from 45 days down to less than 10. They had a 5x, five time increase in performance. And that's a huge win. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. So I want to turn it back over to Joe with Esri. Thanks, Chris and Bill. It was a great presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, first one is, uh, we are using Esri. Do we have to give our contractors access to the full GIS? No, this is Bill. The answer is uh, no, not at all. In fact, you may not want to. As Chris talked about, there, are, with the technology allows you to to get some access for some of the information, others not. The the way this typically is working through web services, and web services really allow you to publish over the web access to to folks things that uh, only you want to give the contractor. So you could imagine uh, giving contractors just a little piece of the network that happened to be what they were working on, or it's a little piece of geography. So the answer is uh, uh, no, you really don't want to give the contractors access to the full GIS. Chris, do you have anything to add on that? You're you're right, Bill. I think the other way that you can you can segment this is is having you know having tools that allow you to uh, separate work as it's assigned by contractors. So you know even contractors working in the same geographical area, uh, we can with these uh, with these tools uh, really separate the information out and keep um, you know keep contractors looking at only their work, but giving you know giving the utilities the ability to see everything as a holistic picture. All right. Uh, next question is, we have an older non-ESRI GIS. Do we have to migrate to ESRI? Yeah, this is Bill. Uh, the answer is actually no. Um, certainly, we'd, as customers, we'd, we'd love to have everybody on our uh, buying our software, but, but we have a number of customers who have um, 
what, what Chris, well, Chris described it earlier. There's three pieces to the overall platform, which is system of records, system of engagement, and system of insight. And the system, in, in some cases, in F, actually in a number of different cases, we have uh, customers who continued with their legacy GIS, that is non-ESRI GIS, as a system of record. But it's pretty easy nowadays to just be able to access that information uh, from some else, some other GIS, and probably supplement it even with with other information from their their uh, enterprise work management system or their asset management system to bring that stuff together in uh, in an Esri system, which is then used to create this notion of system of engagement, the idea to get the information out to the field for this collaboration, communication, and coordination in the field. So the answer is uh, no. And and you can con and and that's why I mean converting from a, a, a non SVGIS to a SVGIS or converting from any GIS from one to another is a fair amount of work. So you don't have to wait to do that. You can begin to take advantage of the Esri platform and the Clarion software really right away. Chris, do you have any more to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add that you know we we certainly have seen this in practice. We have we have a lot of customers um, in North America and, and beyond that um, that have some Esri technology, and they have a you know a lot of other uh, technologies to maybe manage their poles or their networks, and so it can all come together. We can we we can blend all that information together, and even you know take data from you know external sources like you know a CoreLogic uh, parcel data set, bring all of those together into into one view for the for the contractors, and and they don't all have to be coming from an Esri system. All right. Uh, next question: Can we get a temporary license for an emergency response? Yes. Yes. Uh, the way the software is licensed, the well, the Esri software, you can provision groups of people into the platform on a on a limited basis for emergency response or from for particular project uh, over some periods of time. So the answer is yes. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you have anything further on your Clarion software for that. Just that uh, we understand that that's important to, to scale up and scale down, and, and we mirror that flexibility that, that Bill just described on the Esri side. Uh, questions are starting to roll in now. Um, does Clarion rely on mobile networks to operate? So uh, the answer to that is you, you can operate in, in a network disconnected mode. You now that's been a requirement for our customers from the start is if you think about going to a, a fairly remote part of your service territory needing to work for a day or a few days uh, without having uh, mobile broadband or even you know good internet uh, uh, at, at a hotel, that's certainly a a real-world scenario even today for a lot of our customers. So, um, you know, you if you want to sync, if you want to, you know, when you send data back uh, to to the central server and to the main office, uh, obviously you need to have some sort of communications in place there. But to actually go out and do your work, um, you can do all of that in a network disconnected mode. In, in other words, without uh, without connectivity in the field. Just to, just to follow up on that a bit too, Esri has uh, uh, been looking, not been looking, but has been developing uh, technology for disconnected uh, work uh, in many, on many of the devices. But the good news for that is, and I think Chris, you alluded to that earlier, is that um, in the old days, and I, by that I probably mean last Tuesday, back uh, not that long ago, the, some of the smartphones and the tablets really had limited uh, capability. But today, uh, you know, as, as things have developed, you know, your, your tablets and your smartphones have enormous amount of capability, probably not that different from what, what a laptop had only, you know, a couple of years ago. So the more capability in the, in the, the, the hardware as well as the uh, software capability has improved so significantly that uh, disconnected uh, editing and disconnected processing is is very very uh, doable today. And the other thing I think I would also say is that uh, wireless is becoming more and more wireless capability, or maybe I put it the reverse way, is that the lack of internet and wireless capability throughout the world is of course shrinking, and it's probably shrinking at a fairly rapid rate. So. While we, we will need the dis disconnected capability here and there, that's going to become less and less requirement as we move uh, o over time. Thanks, Bill. Um, another question. In terms of vegetation management and asset mapping, 
can these two uses be used simultaneously or are they two different pieces of software? Um, you know, within the, within the clearance solution, they're, they're actually the same uh, pieces of software. They're just um, different configurations. So um, it's really the way that, uh, in the case I, I mentioned uh, before, where our, one of our you know, standard vegetation management customers was able to switch to storm mode, it's just a different configuration. So you can do um, these things together. And actually, it's not uncommon for there to be some type of asset mapping capabilities in a vegetation management or an asset inspection configuration for us so that um, the users can very easily document any any asset or you know network changes that need to be reflected in the core GIS and easily send those back. Uh, any final comments? Yeah, this is Bill. Yeah, this is Bill. First of all, I want to thank everybody for joining the uh, webcast. We're out, virtually out of time. Uh, I just want to kind of go back to my original uh, opening uh, comments about platform, and that, in, in effect, really, I think this is this notion of um, a platform is transformational for for the utility, or really for all of the infrastructure industries. And so, we're really, really pleased that people have adopted this, and we are also very, very proud to have partners like Clearion Software, who have really taken this notion of a ArcGIS platform and developed it into some really, really uh, high value uh, uh, workflow application. And so I want to thank Chris for joining us today and thank Joe and Nydia. And Chris, if you have any final thoughts, we'll say goodbye to everybody and thank you for joining the webinar. Well, thanks and Joe. Uh, just f real quick, I know we didn't get to all the questions, so um, on this last page here there's a way to, to reach out uh, and I know Joe will be following up with everybody that attended. So. Thanks, uh, thanks to you for hosting and thanks to everyone for joining. You guys have a, have a great day.